Hello and you're watching the History Fella channel. In today's video we're looking at Major General Colin Gubbins. The Second World War saw the start of Britain's Special Operations Executive, SOE, which reinvented the art of covert warfare. The organisation recruited, trained and equipped both secret agents and commandos. They launched daring missions against enemy targets and maintained intelligence networks across Europe for nearly the whole length of the war. The man who did the most to shape these operations was Colin Gubbins. Gubbins was a distinctive and sometimes intimidating figure. A short, impeccably dressed Scotsman with a neatly kept hair and moustache. His penetrating gaze made some acquaintances feel uneasy, whilst reassuring for others of his strength of character. His was the sort of mind that Britain needed to lead its covert operations. Military intelligence had been neglected between the wars, and covert warfare was frowned upon as ungentlemanly activity. But Govins had the strength of character to cut through such concerns. Behind his soft speech lay a personality of determination, efficiency, energy and imagination. He was the sort of man who could deliver unconventional solutions. Govins was born in 1897 in Tokyo, where his father was working at the time. Sent home to Scotland at an early age, he was raised by puritanical aunts who encouraged toughness of character and games, pastimes and laughter were all frowned upon. At 16, young Colin moved from one sort of discipline to another when he joined the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, where he gained a reputation for recklessness, recklessness and determination. Commissioned into the artillery, Gubbin spent most of the First World War on the Western Front. He was repeatedly wounded though, including being shot through the neck. He was awarded the Military Cross after digging comrades out of the mud under fire following a German artillery attack. While many of his comrades left the military after the armistice, Gubbin stayed on. He served in Russia, India and Ireland, seeing the new reality of irregular warfare before becoming a desk officer in military intelligence. In the spring of 1939, with war clouds gathering over Europe, Gubbins was recruited to the small group of officers planning to fight Nazi Germany by covert means. He started out by writing guides on irregular warfare. Based on research and his own experiences, he drew on such diverse sources as Lawrence of Arabia, Sinn Féin and Al Capone to create an instruction manual unlike any that had gone before. It covered such practical tr topics as blowing up transport links and poisoning enemy water supplies. Sent to Norway as part of the British force there, they spent the short campaign on the retreat, damaging transport links ahead of the Germans before being evacuated with the rest of the British expedition. In the summer of 1940, the government amalgamated several covert organisations into a single department, the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Gubbins was made Director of Operations and in his role became the most important figure in shaping Britain's covert operations. In September 1943, he became Director General of the entire organisation. By then he had reached the rank of Major General in recognition of his impressive service. The SOE existed to fulfil Winston Churchill's dream setting Europe ablaze, making life impossible for the Nazi occupiers. 
but its work would eventually go beyond this. The work of the SOE in Europe was some of the most remarkable of the Second World War. From the start, the SOE supported resistance movements across the continent. They encouraged the growth of the French resistance, equipping them with both radios and weapons. In Greece, they joined partisans in destroying transport links. And in Poland, Gubbin's old contacts helped them establish vital intelligence networks. They also organised direct attacks by commando units of British and Allied soldiers. These included the sinking of German ships and harbours and the destruction of Norwegian hydroelectric plants vital to the atomic weapons research. The SOE prepared its agents through a unique programme of training and weapons. Gubbins oversaw the specialist facilities for both these activities, recruiting remarkable and unconventional minds to ensure success. He was willing to look beyond the military establishment and recruited colonial policemen, inventors and journalists. He was concerned not with connections or careers, but with skills and experience. The results were amazing. Men and women trained to hide behind German lines, to precisely place explosives and to kill with their bare hands. Weapons ranging from limpet mines to anti-tank missiles to the specialist grenade that killed the brutal Nazi commander of Czechoslovakia, Reinhard, Reinhard Heydrich. Gubbins commissioned operations that reached beyond Europe. On one occasion he sent commandos to act as pirates off the coast of West Africa, stealing three German ships from a Spanish colonial port without anyone knowing who was behind it. On another occasion, operatives in Greece stalled the flow of Axis supplies to the vital fighting in North Africa. And when America entered the war, it learned many lessons from the British example. The techniques Gubbins had developed were carried over into operations against the Japanese in Asia. By the end of the Second World War, Gubbins had created a slickly running machine of which he was immensely proud, but there was no place for the SOE in the post-war world. The executive was shut down. With its closure, Gubbins finally left the military life after more than 30 years. Civilian life, though, didn't suit Gubbins. He worked for a rubber company and then a textile firm but found neither rewarding after the thrill of running the covert war. Instead, he found satisfaction in founding the Special Forces Club in London, where he kept in contact with old colleagues, and in the belated recognition of his work, could openly receive at last, with accolades from leaders around the world. Colin Gubbins died in February 1976 in the Outer Hebrides, where he'd retired with his second wife, Anna.